This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we take a close-up look at asteroids, those lumps of rock, metal, and ice racing around our solar system, uh, occasionally bumping into a planet here and there. Oh. We're also going to so examine five major missions to asteroids happening right now, designed to teach us more about these objects and potentially save us from the fate of the dinosaurs. It's okay, it's okay. We're going to be talking with Bill Botke, Director of Space Studies at Southwest Research Institute, discussing Psyche, the first mission to explore a metal-rich asteroid. We're also going to be joined by Dr. Essen Erkan Elp of Argonne National Laboratory. He's one of the few people in the world studying the first samples from the asteroid Ryugu. Now, most asteroids uh, found near Earth reside in the asteroid belt. Not surprisingly, located between Mars and Jupiter. Some objects known as near-Earth objects, or NEOs, however, pass close to our planet as they orbit the Sun. Now, the vast majority of these pose no apparent threat to our planet. However, a few known as potentially hazardous objects, or PHOs, have the potential to possibly one day collide with our world. This alone provides a meaningful reason to explore asteroids around us. But asteroids also beg to be explored as they hold some of the oldest material in the solar system. By examining these ancient leftovers from the birth of our family of worlds, we can better understand the planet on which most of us live. These missions to asteroids could also teach us about how we might, might possibly avoid catastrophe in the form of a wayward asteroid impacting the Earth. Five missions to asteroids are currently unfolding, developed by space agencies, researchers, and engineers around the globe. Were an asteroid or a comet found heading toward Earth, our best response would depend on the size and speed of the body, as well as the amount of time left until impact. The more warning we have, the better. Now, if astronomers detected a threatening body headed our way in the near future, one of our best options might be to send a spacecraft on a collision course with the upcoming boulder using the kinetic energy of the impact to drive the offending object away from Earth. The Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, is the first mission aimed, literally, at shooting an asteroid with a spacecraft attempting to divert it off course. Asteroid season. Uh, the target of the mission is the smaller of a binary pair of asteroids called Dynamos, the larger, and Dimorphos, the unfortunate. Now, this impact should change the orbit of Dimorphos around its larger parent. Astronomers on Earth will be able to measure that change, providing a look at how impacting a hazardous asteroid in the future might work uh, in the actual realities of space. In 2024, uh, the European Space Agency's HERA mission will return to the system for further analysis of how the impact altered the orbit of Dimorphos. Even if large asteroids like the mountain from space which ended the reign of the dinosaurs are rare, 
smaller bodies, around 150 meters or 500 feet across, about the size of Dimorphos, could still pose a significant risk. The so-called city killers are large enough to destroy a city, and still small enough for, ask for astronomers to easily miss seeing them in the abyss of space. <laughs> Five known asteroids, larger than 20 meters, the threshold at which an asteroid impact could, under the right circumstances, cause citywide damage, are expected to pass within the range of our geostationary communication satellites in the near future. The largest of these, Apophis, is roughly four times wider than the International Space Station, and it will make its closest approach to Earth in 2029. The liftoff of the DART mission is scheduled for the 24th of November. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time, and the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. On the 16th of October, the Lucy mission took off from Earth on a journey towards the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. The mission launched at the first possible moment on a trajectory so perfect that the post-launch course adjustment was canceled. However, Soon after launch, the left solar array failed to fully deploy. Aww. Fortunately, the device is still running about 90% of expected output, providing plenty of power for the spacecraft while engineers diagnose the problem. Now, Lisi is going to follow a complicated path around the solar system as it ventures outward towards destination. Once there, Lucy will pay a call on Trojan asteroids in both regions where these asteroids huddle, orbiting the Sun just ahead and behind Jupiter, journeying around the Sun in a gravitational embrace with the king of the solar system. The Trojan asteroids of Jupiter are composed of some of the oldest material in the solar system. By examining these fossils of the solar system, pictures of events billions of years in the past could be revealed. Lucy plays a critical role in these missions to asteroids as we strive to learn more about the Earth and other planets in our solar system. Lucy was named in honor of the ancient hominid Lucy, whose remains revealed vast amounts of information about early human ancestors more than three million years before our time. Now, about a year from now, Lucy will journey past Earth once more, gaining a gravity assist from our world, adapting its trajectory through space. But this is just the next stop on a journey with a myriad of exciting destinations. One of the things that's most amazing about the Lucy mission is this trajectory that allows us to visit so many objects. It's just spectacular to be able to visit uh, seven different Trojan asteroids over the, with one spacecraft over the course of 12 years. So we do an Earth gravity assist and that pumps up our aphelion. So uh, we're getting further out from the sun and um, 
a couple years later, we fly back and do another earth gravity assist. And this is what pumps our aphelion up out to more than five astronomical units where one AU is the distance between the sun and the earth so that we can get to the Trojan asteroids. As we're flying back out to the Trojan asteroids, we fly past a main belt asteroid as a rehearsal top target in April of 2025. That main belt asteroid we had named uh, Donald Johansson uh, after the discoverer of the Lucy Australopithecus fossil. Um, and so we're going to be taking the Lucy spacecraft to visit the asteroid Donald Johansson, which I think is pretty cool. During its 12-year primary mission, Lucy will explore a record number, a record-breaking number of asteroids, including one in the main belt of our solar system, as well as seven Trojans accompanying Jupiter. No other space mission in history has been launched to as many different destinations in independent orbits around the sun, according to NASA. The Japanese space agency, JAXA, carried out a near-perfect sample return mission to the asteroid Ryugu. Minerals and seawater, which form the Earth as well as materials for life, are believed to be strongly connected in the primitive solar system and the solar nebula from which it formed. Now, Hyposa 2 launched on the 3rd of December 2014, reaching its target on the 27th of June 2018. Following a year and a half of studying the asteroid and collecting samples, the spacecraft headed back to Earth in November of 2019. The samples arrived here and had, were successfully collected by researchers on the ground. Samples from Ryugu are just now being analyzed by a few select investigators around the globe. The Argonne National Laboratory, run by the U.S. Department of Energy, is the only research station in the United States with access to this ultra-rare sample from space. We talked with Dr. Essen Ergon Elp, senior physicist in the X-ray science division at Argonne, about his research. Now, so you folks got to take your first looks at looks at these samples in June and July of this year. Um, what do we know? What do we know so far during the little bit of time you've had to look at them? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it was a great privilege to be one of the first groups in the world to receive uh, uh, samples directly taken from the Ryugu surface and underneath the surface. So one thing that surprised us the most when we received the samples was um, how fluffy they were. Hmm. Their density is very low, about 1.1 to 1.3 gram per cc, and they almost float on the surface of the water. And so that was one, one of the things we were surprised about was the low density. Before Ryugu samples arrived, we practiced ourselves for about two years of what might be this contain what might be contained in these samples. And we have measured spectra after spectra from these samples uh, over two years. So we had an idea about what to expect. And uh, we were also secretly hoping that we will see something that we didn't expect. And indeed, that seems to be the case. There are a lot of surprises in these samples. We are going to defer to our Japanese collaborators to put the papers together. Hopefully by the end of the year, the scientific community will have a real chance to see the data and its interpretation. But I can assure you, our audience, that indeed it is full of surprises. That's great. And now you folks um, at the Argonne National Lab uh, have, of course, the advantage of the advanced photon source. And you have the on you are the only institution in the United States to have samples of Ryugu. 
Um, what what makes your facility so so uniquely qualified to to have? To that's, a very, that's a very good point. Uh, APS or Advanced Photon Source, as we call it, has about seventy five very unique stations. Each one, in its own way, uh, pushes the limits of X ray science and X ray technology to the limits. And one of them is our beam line, which uh, I have built about 25 years ago. And we have a great team to continuously improve our beam line. The, the, the nice feature of the beam line is that it is very unique in terms of looking at iron and iron minerals. We have a very unique way of looking at the combination of the iron nucleus and the iron electrons and their interaction from which we garner a lot of information about what kind of minerals they were, what kind of conditions under which they have formed, and how much of each mineral phase exists. So we have a very microscopic uh, resolution, so we can, like an X-ray microscope, we have a microscope called MESFAR microscope, and this particular microscope only exists in the United States at Argonne. That's fascinating. And so how do you plan to put all this amazing technology to work? How will you be studying the, these unique samples? Well, these samples uh, have never seen oxygen, at least Earth's atmosphere. And so we are required to keep it that way. So we have to study the samples inside the plastic bags they were sealed with. But uh, we were lucky enough to communicate with our Japanese colleagues through our French colleagues, which made the initial contact, to receive one of the largest grains, which is about uh, 200 micron to 300 micron across, which is about the two, three of times of your hair. For us, it's a huge sample. And so we were lucky enough to get big enough samples to do the spectroscopy and diffraction that we need to do. So we combine several X-ray techniques all at once in order to accomplish this mineralogical identification in a unique way so that it has value to our collaborators in Japan. Great. Well, thanks so much, Shurkan. It was great talking with you. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Now, while most asteroids are rock or mostly rock, Psyche breaks the mold in being composed largely of metal. The first mission of Psyche, coincidentally also named Psyche, Psyched for Psyche, presents a unique opportunity to study what could be an analog of a site never before seen by human eyes, the core of our own Earth. Although geologists are able to deduce quite a lot of information about the core of the Earth, the number of geologists who have actually traveled to the center of the Earth remains stubbornly at zero. Works by Jules Verne notwithstanding. That Psyche is the member of these five missions to asteroids, which might give us our first glimpse at seeing something resembling the metal core of our own planet. One possible idea for the odd nature of Psyche, the asteroid, is that this body is exactly what it seems. The exposed core of an ancient planet shattered long ago, although this idea is not confirmed. But examination will reveal if Psyche, the asteroid, was found at the center of an ancient dead world, or if it is an odd, independent lump of metal whizzing through space. Dr. Bill Botke, Director of Space Studies at Southwest Research Institute, visited, visited with us discussing this fascinating mission. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Bill Botke. He is Director of the Department of Space Studies at the Southwest Research Institute, and he's here to talk to us about the spacecraft psyche going to the asteroid psyche. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, what do we know so far about this asteroid, Psyche, and what makes it so special? Well, 
Psyche is a fascinating asteroid. It's one of the largest asteroids in the asteroid belt. It's about, about 200 kilometers in size. So, so for reference, if you were, let's say, uh, in Phoenix and you wanted to drive to Flagstaff to see the Grand Canyon, that distance is about the same as the diameter of Psyche. It's about 200 kilometers across. But one of the reasons we want to visit Psyche in particular is it seems to be a metal-rich object. Now, there's only so many ways that an asteroid gets to be metal-rich. One possibility is Psyche is the core from a much larger object that disrupted. Okay, so, so for example, the Earth has a core. We know this from seismology. We know this from, um, from other investigations we have of the Earth. And our core, we think, is made of solid metal and liquid metal. But unfortunately, there's no easy way to go visit our core. So um, the alternative is to let nature perhaps give us a core that's been exposed. Very early on in planet formation, um, the so solar system was dominated by major collisions. And it's possible some of these collisions may have stripped off the crust and mantle from some large world that was trying to form, leaving an exposed core. It's very possible that Psyche is metal rich because it is the byproduct of some of those events. The other possibility is Psyche is just metal rich because it formed from metal rich materials that happened to be natural in some part of the solar system, which is completely wild and incredible. So either way, we think we have a fantastic target to go after, and it's our first chance to really investigate an object like this. We've been to rocky bodies, we've been to icy bodies, but we've never been to a body which is dominated by metal. And so we're not really sure what it'll be like. And that makes it all exciting uh, for all of us. And so, so how much metal is there? I know it was originally reports much higher than some recent studies have said, but what do we know and what type of metal is it? We're not sure how much metal it has because it depends a lot on the internal structure of the body. Um, we're thinking right now is it's probably at least 30 to 40% metal, and it could be as high as 70 to 80% metal, depending on different conditions of how broken up is the interior and how much uh, what they call porosity, which is how much void space does it have inside. You can imagine taking like a, a, a rock and smashing it into pieces and then putting it back together. That would leave you some void space between all the different rocks and the rest. It'd be hard to get it exactly shaped back into uh, its original shape. Psyche may be that way. And so it may have a lower density because it has a lot of um, a lot of space that were produced by major collisions in the past. So do we know what sort of metals are there? It's probably mostly iron metal, we think is part, but it may have some others as well. Uh, it's possible um, it may have some, uh, you know, rare earth metals like platinum and gold and other things in it as well, but probably in fairly small abundances. The major metal is going to be iron. Hmm. And so tell us a little bit about uh, this wonderful little spacecraft, Psyche, that's, that's heading off there to, to explore this. Well, Psyche, is a, a Psyche, the spacecraft, is very exciting. It's it's shaped like a box. So essentially, if you had a person, let's say a normal-sized person standing up, I suppose normal size depends on the kind of person you are, but but imagine you had like a, a a man or a woman standing up. The Psyche spacecraft is about a little bit about a, about a about one and a half times the size of a person, and it has several instruments on it. Okay, it has what we call a neutron spectrometer. This will allow us to um, understand the composition of the surface of this body. It has a gamma ray spectrometer, which also will be doing some of the same things. It has an imaging, uh, imaging, imaging spectrometer on it, so it's gonna also allow us to look at the composition in a different way and take amazing pictures of things. And then finally, it has a magnetometer on it. So this will allow us to measure if it has a magnetic field. And if it does, the signature of the magnetic field may allow us to see whether it was something that came from a core and how it may have crystallized over time. Like how does the, if a core was molten and then it solidified, did it solidify from the outside in or the inside out? They can actually tell this by looking at the magnetic signature we get from the body itself. So fascinating. So of all these discoveries, which one, what, what question about Psyche has you most interested? Well, I think, it, I, I think the, the, the biggest science question for me 
is I'm a dynamicist. So I worry a lot about uh, planet formation and how to, you know, where did all these objects come from? And one of the really fascinating questions for me is where was Psyche formed? Okay. So for most of your, for most of the people listening here, when you think of the asteroid belt, you think of objects that are between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And most people would think, well, the asteroid belt is made of things that formed in that region. But a lot of the new studies of planet formation suggest that the asteroid belt may not just be from things that formed in that zone, but actually may have come from the same zone where our planets formed, like Earth and Venus and the rest. And there may also be asteroids that came in from the outer solar system that may have formed in the same region as Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, or maybe even beyond Neptune, back where we have sort of the realm of comets. So some of the more interesting evidence is pointing in the direction that maybe Psyche came from the same zone as the giant planets. So the same places where our giant gas giants formed. So the question is, why would you have a metal rich object forming in this region where you have ices, where you have, you're building giant cores, which ultimately can grab gas and make the giant planets. If we can solve that problem of where Psyche comes from, I think we can say a lot of important things about how planet formation might work. That is that's absolutely fascinating. And so what other ways can studying Psyche help us learn more about our solar system and our own planet Earth? Well, if Psyche happens to be an exposed core, okay, then we can learn something about how do cores form? So, so maybe a good question, maybe I should start with this question. So how do cores form in the first place? Mm -hmm. We think what happens is that early on in solar system history, um, you know, asteroids are the building blocks of the plants. They're coming together, they're striking one another, and they're making bigger and bigger objects. And as they grow bigger and bigger, in some cases, what also happens is that because it's very early on in solar system history, they form with certain isotopes that radioactively decay and generate heat. Okay, some, uh, some of these elements aren't around today, but they are very prominent in the early solar system. So these elements start to produce heat, and also, just as they get going, there's also the fact that the more dense things in the Earth want to go to the center of the Earth, and the lighter things want to float to the top, okay? So eventually, what we do is we start to build a core, which is uh, molten, and it helps create the molten interior of the Earth as well, okay? So but, the, you know, so, but we only have the vaguest idea of what actually happened, because this was four and a half billion years ago. There's been a lot of things that have happened since that time. So looking at an exposed core from a different asteroid or for a different body may give us insights as to how our Earth actually came to be and also how the cores of other planets like Venus, like Mercury and the rest may have come to be. This is a, a huge issue in, in geology and, in, planet, and, and um, in planetary science is understanding the interiors of worlds. And our best insights into this may actually come from the asteroids, interestingly enough. That is so fabulous. And, you know, it's a widely, widely held knowledge that um, the astro that uh, the dinosaurs somehow failed to develop a space program. <laughs> and uh, we humans uh, have several space programs that are looking out for asteroids that might be headed our way. So how can how can this mission help us? help us learn more about, about planetary defense and protecting our planet. So one of the big issues for planetary defense is detecting all the asteroids that might hit the Earth. And so right now we're actually, uh, NASA is helping to fund um, teles telescopic surveys that scan the night sky looking for asteroids. And in a few years, there's a mission called NEO Surveyor, which will be a space-based space telescope they'll be looking for threatening asteroids. And so that's going to go a long way to solving that problem. But where Psyche comes in has to do with the fact that we don't always understand the physical properties of these bodies. So for example, let's say we find an asteroid and it's on a collision trajectory with the Earth. Okay, One of the big things we'd want to know is what, you know, what is it made of? What kind of internal structure does it have? How would we might deflect it away from Earth or do something else maybe even to blow it up? You could imagine that an object that is, let's say, very puffy 
and more almost like a dust bunny, like maybe sometimes what people think comets are like, that might be very different to deflect than something that is very iron rich and strong and has a lot more mass associated with it. So Psyche is sort of one end of the spectrum of different of certain kinds of asteroids, while comets and other things are maybe at the other end of the spectrum. And if we're worrying about the hazard to the Earth, ultimately we're going to need to understand both so we can come up with the right procedure to deflect either one if that uh, happenstance comes about. So one of, the, one of the really interesting aspects of flying a spacecraft is that like when you're in orbit around an asteroid, that you can really sense the mass distribution that's, in, that's, that's below you. Okay, so, and sometimes asteroids can have a very unusual distribution of material. And in some cases, you can imagine, let's say, some part of the asteroid might have a, a solid rock, which isn't like a bunch of powder or something else, right? Mm -hmm. That can actually give you a, a, an increase in the gravitational tug compared to some other place, right? So when spacecraft fly above asteroids or even above the moon and the rest, they sort of go up and down. And they're almost like a little roller coaster as they get pulled and tugged by the different mass differences that we see on the surface. And those little tugs and pulls we can measure using radio experiments. And from that, we can actually learn a lot about the mass distribution that we have inside the body. So for example, is Psyche a body which has been pulled in from end? And so essentially is a rubble pile completely disorganized inside? Or is it something which has been you know, more or less coherent? And inside, it maybe has a core and maybe a stony or rocky exterior. Or so, and that's and that's so. It's not, in some ways, it's not so different than what we have in the Earth. Or is it some combination of the two? This is something we might be able to get at just by watching how the spacecraft uh, changes its orbit as it goes around the body, and then using the, the uh, radio signals we have to really measure the gravity field in some detail, and then use that to infer what's going on in the interior of Psyche. Fabulous. And finally, what is next for Psyche? This well, the next... <laughs> Well, the next big event is the launch, which is coming up in August. So we're all on pins and needles. We're excited for this. We're excited to let it go. And then, you know, once it launches, then the science team will get to start to do its thing. And we'll start to prepare for entering into orbit with Psyche and all the analysis we're going to have. So we have a, we have an, a mission which we're going to start off with a fairly distant orbit around Psyche as we try to get a feeling for its gravitational field and the rest. And then we're going to slowly get closer and closer and closer. And eventually we may be going at very, very small distances over the surface as we try as much as we can to probe what's going on in the interior of this interesting body. Hey, boss. And thank you so much for being on the show, Bill. It was great talking with you. It was great talking to you. Now, Psyche, the spacecraft, is currently scheduled for launch no earlier than the 1st of August of 2022. Following a close encounter with Mars in 2023, the mission should reach its destination in 2026 and proceed to study this metallic planetary bobble for at least 21 months. On 8th of September 2016 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, the OSIRIS-REx uh, mission lifted off on its journey to explore the asteroid Biyunu. Now, like Hoyabusa 2, OSIRIS-REx is a sample return mission designed to bring back pieces of an asteroid to Earth for analysis. The spacecraft successfully collected material from Bennu in 2018, and it's due to arrive back at Earth in 2023, when it will deliver the samples to researchers for analysis. Although most asteroids pose no threat to Earth, Bimu may be an exception. There is a small but not impossible chance that Bimu might strike the Earth at some point in the next couple of hundred years. Roughly one chance in a couple thousand. That's about the same as your chances of dying by choking on food. 
assuming we survive as a technological species, our descendants might one day need to de deflect Binu off course, diverting it from a collision with our world, the moon, or even interplanetary outposts. Even barring such an impending disaster, Osiris Rex could provide critical evidence in our quest to understand some of the most profound questions we have today about the Earth. This mission is going to help scientists investigate how planets formed and how life began, and it could help improve our understanding of the asteroids that might impact Earth one day. Together, this quintet of missions to asteroids could open up vast amounts of new knowledge about our local family of planets, asteroids, and comets. As we reach out into space, these five missions to asteroids will provide a wealth of new data protecting robotic and human travelers in the dangerous terrain of the final frontier as we journey beyond our planetary cradle. On 30th of November, we're going to talk with Matthew, Matthew Bothwell about his new book, The Invisible Universe. They'll tell us about radio, ultraviolet, and infrared astronomy, which opens our eyes to the vast majority of the visible universe that we cannot see in ordinary visible light. Or make sure to join us then. For more information about space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net Bye! Bye.